Okay. Um. So, Aviva, where, did you see the email that I replied back to? Not yet. Let me go look. Okay. Um. So while we're getting that sorted out, um, we have some new new faces on the call. So, um, if it's okay with everyone. Uh, let's go around and say our names and our affiliation and where we're calling in from. Um, I can go first. My name's Gina. Um, I am the clean program coordinator. Um, and I am calling in from uh, Colchester, Vermont today. Um, I'll send it over to Carolyn. Or maybe Mark. Okay, I'm Mark Bonanis. I am with a little uh, nonprofit called McKnowledge and calling in from Philadelphia today, normally in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Nice. Um, let's send it over to our um, dynamic trio. Let's start with Eric. So uh, Eric calling in from Oakland with two of my colleagues uh, it's from the Chabot Space and Science Center. It's a, it's a public science center up at the, in the Oakland Hills. I see Mark nodding, so you know the, know the location. And I uh, work for a group called, actually, well, full-time in a group called Community Resources for Science. We do a lot of teacher uh, programs and curriculum development, but I'm also um, doing a part-time contract job here at the Science Center. Uh, relaunching a teacher training program and and i'd been at the science center for 22 years um, prior to taking having the other job so uh, but excited to have my two colleagues here so maybe i'll pass it over to the left from the, the fellow from portland to frank okay can um i'm i'm doing this we we've <laughs> oh just got muted again sorry go ahead okay Anyway, we're doing an interesting routine, multiple computers or, or multiple devices, only one of which has the, has the microphone on. So hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I'm, I'm Frank Gratch, I'm from Portland, Oregon, uh, person next to me. That's me, I'm Annette Carter and I'm his wife. So we were, um, I'm most time with Portland State, uh, also have, uh, also involved with uh, QEW, a Quaker Earth Care witness. Um, we're on a road trip uh, down to the Bay Area and then uh, grabbing the train into uh, Denver tomorrow. So, Wendy, I guess you're still in uh, you're still in Washington D.C., right? Nope, I'm in Arvada, Colorado, but I head to Boston this weekend. <laughs> Oh boy. No okay. moss growing on me. My climate. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, delightful to actually be in a room where I'm seeing some of the some of the folks I've known for years in 3D space. <laughs> and so the, the the logical person to turn it over to is James, who's also here in the same room. Hi, so I'm Jim or James Callahan uh, with climatechangeeducation.org and the Mobile Climate Science Labs. And finally, uh, at Lowell School in Washington, DC, I am the Climate and, uh, Education and Action Specialist. So all looking forward and uh, understand we've got art today. So really looking forward to today. Thanks, Thanks Eric. Yeah, super fun seeing you all together. I'm impressed that you've been able to figure out the uh, three screen situation <laughs> as a technological feat. Um, I'll pass it over to, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna pronounce your name right. Bosley, Bosley? <laughs> yes, I'm Bosika Glomutz. I'm calling in from um, Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. And I'll pass it on to Rick. 
Hi everyone, uh, Rick Reynolds. I'm the founder of Engaging Every Student. We develop educational resources, working with partners. A um, couple of the fun projects I'm working on right now are a game called The Astounding Adventures of Marco the Water Molecule. It teaches all about water and the water cycle, uh, extreme weather and ways uh, kids can take action for a sustainable future. Um, and uh, I also just do other environmental education uh, projects, trying to connect kids with nature. Um, so, uh, one of our partners for that project is the American Meteorological uh, Society, so maybe I'll pass it over to Wendy. Hi Rick, nice to see you today. Hi people I haven't met and those I have. Um, I'm Wendy Abshire, I'm the director for the American Meteorological Society's education program. I'm fortunate to be a member of the CLEAN board, a participant in the upcoming Excels conference, so I look forward to that piece of today's chat. And it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I'm trying to say, who hasn't gone? I think, Carolyn, you're back, right? You had crashed, but you're back? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. all you. Uh, so yeah, Carol, uh, my name's Carolyn. I work with CLEO Institute, um, which is a climate education advocacy group in Florida. Uh, we are currently running a campaign. Um, I'll drop the link, I'll drop the link in the chat. But uh, I mean, up from last week, nothing, uh, nothing new to report, really. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Rummel. I work for the UCAR Center for Science Education. I'm calling in from Boulder, Colorado today. Um, that's where our offices are. And I'm an education designer, so I make a lot of content for the K-12 audience related to Earth System Sciences, um, climate and weather, things like that, and also do like teacher training and work on a bunch of direct funded projects to design curriculum or training for teachers in schools. Awesome. <clears throat> um, great group today. Um, I will let um, Aviva introduce herself in a few moments, but uh, before we jump into that, I just wanted to quickly give any time for announcements. We don't have too, too long, but if there's anything anyone wants to announce, feel free to go ahead. You can also use um, the chat. Uh, yeah, Jim. Jim, I see you have your hand raised. Right, I'm, I'm not doing. I'm not doing my job. I'm the guy that, no, that's toggling know. the mute for all of us. Oh. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'll, I'll look to be really brief. Uh, next Saturday is the Bay Area Youth Climate Summit, one of the most developed and largest in the country. Uh, students from mostly high school students from all over the Bay Area will be there. Uh, it's a it's a great event. They take part in the science festivals, which we are really pleased about. And then uh, the following Saturday is one of the Bay Area science festivals uh, at Hayward State or Cal, uh, Cal State University East Bay. Um, so they're back and they're very powerful and uh, bringing quality hands on climate science and other science to very diverse families. Thank you. Great. That's awesome. Um... Yes, Eric. <laughs> Actual hand. Um, so I, I think next week, Tina, if this is still a go, we were going to talk about uh, COP, COP27 next week um, a little bit. Yeah. Um, does that still look good? So just wanted to give folks a heads up if you're interested in, in sort of learning more about COP. There's a project that I've been working on with some colleagues to, um, um, we're partnering with a group from Italy called Future Food Institute, and we're going to create these short 15 minute uh, Instagram videos in October. Uh, there'll be live stream Instagram, Instagram live events, um, but then they'll also be recorded and hopefully shared in the Italian pavilion at, at COP in Egypt. So, and then I, I know Frank's been also working on some COP related stuff. I'm sure that, that so anyway, all of all things COP, if, if folks have things to, to bring or have been or, or have questions, it'd be great to, to see folks next week. Um, that is definitely on the calendar for next week. So um, anyone who's interested in learning more about COP, I definitely encourage you to attend. Um, a little bit later, 
in the semester when COP is actually happening, I think we're going to have some delegates from Climate Generations Group um, be on the call um, when I, I think it's the first the first Tuesday of COP. Um, so that might be also a fun call to join if you are interested in um, COP stuff. I am, well, any other announcements um, before I move on? Yeah, feel free to keep putting things in the chat if um, you have ideas that pop up. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Um, so we talked about this super briefly last week, but this is our roadmap, event roadmap for the Accelerating Climate Capacity Engagement and Leadership Summit um, that is happening this Thursday. Um, Thank you everyone that's registered and planning to attend. Um, if you can't attend, I uh, we're hoping to record it and um, share, probably share it out on the listserv after the event. And we're also hoping it'll be an annual thing. So if this isn't your year, maybe next year. Um, but some folks last week were asking about um, what, uh, like what's going to be happening at the actual event, and um, all um participants are going to have access to this roadmap it has all of our important links at the top some tech help and then the detailed agendas down here um so there's you know day one and day two um the whole purpose of the event is really going to be networking and collaboration building um we want folks to um folks with similar interest areas uh to talk to each other and hope that some new collaborations are going to come out of this um, and the climate education community has um, always met um, during other conferences like um, AMS and uh, ADU and um, NAAA. So we're really excited that we're going to be hosting a space for climate and energy literacy folks uh, specifically dedicated to them. So what we're going to have, um, Frank and Katie are going to open. Um, our first plenary speaker is going to be Daniel Wildcat, who is an Indigenous speaker. <clears throat> he is going to be talking about partnership building. Um, after that, we're going to have a series of Ignite Talks. Um, very own Anna Gold will be talking about education. The Sautis, who many of you know through the um, ACE framework, is going to be talking about action and community engagement. We have this amazing young woman named Leticia from Ecuador who created her own organization um, about uh, including women in STEM. Um, Sean McQueen, who is a member of the Queen Network, is going to be talking about workforce development. Um, and then we have a representative from NSF um, who's gonna be talking about policy and funding. Um, after that, we're going to have people uh, kind of self-select into breakout rooms based on these topic areas, education, action, uh, diversity, workforce, and policy. Um, I'm going to be talking about these specific questions based on what the topic area you're interested in is. Uh, we'll do report outs. Um, and then from that, we're going to kind of have folks talk about what they're hoping to work on, the, on in the future and do kind of more networking there. Um, and then reflect on that. And the last half hour of the day is just going to be more kind of like casual, informal discussions, getting to know you, that type of thing. Um, quickly moving through day two, we have Lindsay Kirkland from Climate Generation doing the welcome inter introduction for day two. She's going to set it up for our friend from the Climate Mental Health Network, Leanne Zeitz, um, to talk about personal reflections with climate change and mental health. Um, and specific actions you can take there. Um, Katie's going to kind of wrap all that up and specifically speak about uh, reflections from day one. Um, and then Don Haas is going to uh, set it up for the next set of breakouts um, and try to have everyone um, kind of identify what's emerging and what's missing from our conversation still another breakout from that. Um, 
and then Bart Merrick, who is um, who worked with Frank at NOAA, uh, Frank Neopold at NOAA, um, is going to help folks name new collaborations and commitments. We'll have another breakout about that. And then we're going to review that. And Anna and I are going to do the closing. Um, also in this roadmap, we have all of the bios for speakers. So that's really long. I'm not going to show all of it to you. So you can kind of click about this. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of a breakdown of the day. I know some folks last week wanted to see that. Um, I'll put the, the event rate link to sign up in the chat one more time. But otherwise, it's happening this week. And thanks, everyone, for um, supporting it. I know many, many of you on this call have been like active members of, of Queen and um, of this event. And I really appreciate your support for that. So um, that's that. We're really excited. Um, and now the rest of the time, I am going to hand it over to Aviva. Um, one second here. Aviva, you have the um, ability to share your screen, right? Um, I haven't tried yet, but I presume that's correct. And if not, I'll complain. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that green share screen button at the bottom should be working for you. Okay, you um, want me to go directly to my presentation? Yeah, I'll just, I'll read your bio quickly. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Viva's longstanding interdisciplinary art practice focuses on ecological restoration as art making. Her projects have won numerous grants and fellowships and have been written and exhibited internationally. She is an affiliate of the Institute for Arctic and Alpine Research at uh, CU at Boulder, gained her PhD from University of Plymouth in the UK, crossing over environmental sciences, technology, and studio art, and she received her BFA, MFA from CalArts. She is the author of Divining uh, Chaos, the autobiography of an idea which explores how art can help us see our way of, out of a chaotic and declining world. Her current project, Bleed Trees, resists ecocide by challenging the legal basis to build fossil fuel infrastructure. She is co-founder of the Eco Art Listserv and co-editor of Eco Art in Action Activities, Case Studies, and Provocations for Classrooms and Communities. So um, it looks like your slides are working, which are great. And I see um, Aviva also put her information in the chat. Um, so that is good too, if anyone wants to get in touch with her. And now I will stop talking <laughs> so she can talk. Thank you so much, Gina, and I'm delighted to join you all. I'm on Vinyl Haven Island in Maine, and I'm hoping to introduce you all to some ideas about art and its relationship to environmental issues that might be new to some of you. So my premise is that art is undersourced as an argument to make the kinds of changes that we need to make ecologically. And by art, I'm not talking about making posters or uh, illustrating the work of scientists. I'm talking about systems change. So this, I think, is the systems change that we have to address right now which is the continued proliferation of fossil fuels and the impact on all of us. And I will comment, because I understand many of you are involved with educating younger people, that one of the reasons I have found that people are very interested in my work is that I've been doing it forever. I didn't just jump on a bandwagon two years ago because I heard it was fashionable. So they have this new registry about fossil fuels that I believe is launching today, and you may want to check it out. It's quite alarming. And I think the only possible solution, we're looking at the effects of tar sands in Canada, is to consider, this is from Alaska, is to seriously consider the legal issues involved. This is the book that I co-edited. It has 67 essays that may be really useful for all levels of education. You can access it from NYU Press rather than Amazon. 
and I'm going to take you through some of my early work and try to make some connections and the ideas I was working with when I was quite young and the ideas I'm working with now that I think are quite practical. This is a still from a ritualized performance that I did in California in 1972 in which I gathered some fresh water from the tap at CalArts. We drove to the ocean. We stopped several times to exchange the water with soil. At the ocean, we dumped out what was left, and then we gathered the, the sea water and made the same trip back where we flushed the water down the toilet. And the name of this project was physical education. And the reason I named it that was because I thought at the time that we were being taught to flush our water down the toilet. In 1976, I did a series of documentations of dawns and sunsets from one view in San Diego where they were planning to put in um, oil rigs. And my idea was I was going to capture the view before they did that. Fortunately, they didn't. This is an image from 2010 about my impression of climate change. This is an image from the bayou as I was heading to Baton Rouge for a conference on deltaic regions. And I was particularly interested in the relationship between deltaic regions, climate change, and um, demographic crises such as in Bangladesh, Sudan, and New Orleans at the time. And it was around then that I was starting to work with Jim White from Instar. He's the former director there, as you may know. And uh, we began working in 2007 when we were paired to work on a, an ex exhibition at um, the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art. Around 1982, I was doing wave studies. This is from Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And what I was interested in was not just the dynamics of the waves, but how they would affect the oil rigs. And that idea has carried over. I'm still working on representing wave action. This is a public art project that's still in progress at the Vinyl Haven Ferry Landing. It represents a crashing wave. It was first installed in 2000, and I'm finally getting around to finishing it with crushed glass. And what it means to me is we're going to be facing sea level rise here on this island, and God knows what's going to happen to any of us. So hopefully it'll provoke some conversations. In 1990, I bought the local town dump, which was largely made land for the quarrying industry to take granite up and down the coast, and I started to restore it. That was a project. I called it ghost nets because the lost drift nets, which you may be familiar with, that get loose in the ocean and strip mine the seas of marine life, seem to me like the ideas and behaviors that are familiar to us that we don't change and they kill us. This was some GIS work that I was doing on the fisheries industry and specifically the relationship between the incidence of eelgrass and the uh, abundance of fin fish in the Gulf of Maine. And it was somewhat inconclusive, but what we came to was that there's possibly a relationship between eelgrass and finfish, and we now know that's true. This is from my dissertation about uh, 10 years ago. So out of all this work, I developed six rules to create a complex adaptive model, and they're mostly based on physics, such as there will always be a small point of entry into any chaotic system. And what I learned from GIS work, layering information will test perceptions. I'm not going to go into this in detail because we don't have a whole lot of time. Out of my work with Jim, and then I started working with Jean Turner as well about 2010, we started a project called Fish Story where we analyzed the degradation from dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico and where could we affect some land restoration 
up the uh, Mississippi River that could affect change. And of course, the main thing that would affect change would be uh, to eliminate the fertilizers that are coming down into the Gulf. But an incidental insight that came out of our work together, and this is just a detail from a much larger and more complex installation, was that Jim and I calculated the math of exactly how much revegetation and reforestation would be required to mitigate climate change. And we came up with some figures that were pretty close to what scientists came up to oh, just recently. We did this one in 2012 or 2013, and the recent research that was published was just a couple years ago. So if, if scientists had considered working with artists not as um, a support system for their work, we might have addressed this kind of question a lot earlier and made a little bit more progress on the problem. That's my point. So this is just a detail of the excavation work that I did on the GhostNet site. And what you see here is the highest known storm surge line in 1994. We took out 16 truckloads of riprap to restore the estuary. And this is a detail from where the freshwater met saltwater for the first time in 100 years. And this is what the site looks like now. This is the East Gardens, and these are the West Gardens of the site, which is about two and a half acres. So from that work, I calculated how could we, in fact, develop a number of sites for restoration that could impact the whole island, which is really important in terms of the fisheries in the Gulf of Maine. And so we identified this point here where two parts of the island meet. And so to address that problem, we had a, uh, a, a causeway that was too narrow. What I did to draw attention to it was to paint the boulders alongside it with about 30 large boulders with this slurry of buttermilk and moss and ultramarine blue, which is non-toxic. It drew lots of attention, and the result was that the USDA uh, invested a, over half a well, five hundred thousand, almost a million dollars, and it restored twenty six acres. And this is a detail of that restoration. So Jim and I went a little bit further with this idea of uh, the relationship between deltaic zones and um, climate change and conflict, and we found some pretty alarming stuff mostly, of course, about climate change refugees. Out of all of that, it became really clear that we had to stop using fossil fuels. So I developed a project that I'm still working on, which is called the Blue Trees Project. This was from a phase of the project called the Blue Trees Symphony, in which I designed a series of aerially conceived measures and in this map you can see one of those measures each one is one third mile long each one of these dots represents a note that corresponds to this melodic refrain and these are how the tree notes were designated with a vertical sine wave so that was a recapitulation of my interest in waves and we did that across north america there's one tree note in Virginia. And so this is what it would look like if it were completely realized, which is one of the things I'm working on now to create an opera from all this. These blue dots are where we did sites of those measures. The gold is where you see concentration of human population, and the colors represent the relationship of various habitat types. And that was shown around the world um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. This is from South Korea. This is from Virginia. The legal premise that we copyrighted it with was that since art is entitled to protection, if this project were protected, it would contest eminent domain takings. And in this particular installation, there were a series of suspended translucent panels, and the text on them was taken from my writings 
And this one says it's really important to pay attention to arguments over owners' rights and rights in general because it comes down to what we value. So we had a mock trial to test the premises and we won an injunction. Now, if you aren't familiar with uh, legal ideas, the point of a mock trial is to rehearse the legal arguments that can be used in real trials in real courts, and it was reviewed in law journals. So art has a lot to do with philosophical positions, and mine represents the question whether patriarchal systems, and I'm not referring to patriarchy as a gender-based concept or system, is ecocide of the environment with impunity, as we're seeing right now, is that in the inevitable result of patriarchal systems on all levels. So I took some of these ideas just a little bit further in a collaboration with a modeler in the UK at King's College. And we started from the premise that maybe fire is trying to tell us something. And we did a lot of GIS modeling with the idea that tigers might, or yeah, tigers might represent a metaphor for how, for how fire itself is something that we actually need to protect. And so there was a lot of visual stuff and narrative material that came out of that collaboration. But uh, the, where it was left was that very likely indigenous people have some ideas about this idea that fire is not the threat we experience it as, but it might actually be trying to tell us something and it would behoove us to pay attention. And this is my own book, which also came out this past summer. It's about uh, how we might address all the chaos we're seeing in our ecological systems, but I made a point in this book of addressing it from an extremely personal point of view for a couple of reasons. One is because I think of myself as an eco-feminist and I think the answer to patriarchy and to ecocide is in how women deal with systems change. And I, I should be careful about saying women because there are just as many part patriarchal women as there are patriarchal men. Um, but I did try to make an analogy between how we are devastating the environment and, for example, a woman's experience of rape. And uh, this is where you can get the book. It's also NYU Press. Uh, these are both books are published by New Village Press. And that is it. And I would welcome any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, Aviva. Um, yeah, feel free to raise your hand or jump in to the um, chat if you want. I appreciate that you shared some of your artwork with us too. It was really nice to see that. Thank you. Some examples, yeah. Um, I would also yeah. welcome anybody who wants to challenge my premises. <laughs> we have one. I have a, yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Thank you so much. So impressive indeed. Um, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about your background because I'm really interested in you as a person and how you uh, come up with these ideas. Where do you draw your inspiration from and what your experiences may be like? And then too, I'm also interested in how do you fund your work? Because uh, these are big scale projects and I can see that they may require a lot of resources. Thank you. Thank you for both questions and neither one is easy to answer. Let me start with money because that's practical. Uh, it is very, very difficult to fund this kind of work, to put it mildly. 
yesterday I did a presentation at SUNY uh, Buffalo and for the presentation plus four studio visits I earned a thousand dollars for the day. My total expenses for a, a year are close to about 78000 And do the math. It's not difficult. Um, but I spent 17 hours on those, those few hours. So it was a total of two hours, uh, about five hours of actual presentation one way or the other, 17 hours of preparation, I earned $1,000. There are grants for this kind of work. And in the past year, I've been rejected by 21 funding sources. I'm waiting to hear about uh, one more. And I should be hearing next month. That would be about 25000 And I just finished two proposals that could total as much as 200000 but they're extremely competitive. One is for the Guggenheim, and one is a fellowship at uh, Radcliffe, Harvard Radcliffe. So needless to say, I, uh, I have a, a fierce challenge. I do have a few modest patrons. I do sell occasional artwork. I have been uh, lucky in some of my real estate investments, and by real estate investments, I don't mean that I'm buying apartment buildings. I mean that I was clever about when and where I bought land in California and San Diego, and when I built a house there, and when I sold it to come to Maine, and there's maybe one other real estate project that made me a little bit of money, and I don't mean millions. Um, I have done adjunct teaching. I am now 77 and I cannot get a, even an adjunct job. It's really, really frustrating and it's a little bit scary. Um, and I carry on. And that is why I said at the beginning that it's very often young people who are most interested in my work and my story not just because it brings new ideas to the table, but because I'm so effing stubborn. So that's a partial answer, I think, to your money question. Uh, now the question of how I started and what inspires me. The simplest answer would be in two stories, two or three stories. One is that my father was a developer. And when I was a little girl, I used to walk with my dog in the woods and I would pretend that I was going to be like Hiawatha and learn how to walk in the woods without stepping on leaves, dry leaves in the fall and not make any sound. Uh, it didn't occur to me that I was wearing shoes, not moccasins, and not barefoot, and there was absolutely no way that I could not make sound. But I did my best. And my father took a look at those woods and thought, oh, I could build at least five or six houses there. And that was the end of those woods. And so I think what was born in me was the desire to undo all his work. As far as what continued to inspire me, besides my stubbornness and my defiance and my rage, I have always been extremely inspired by indigenous thinking and indigenous work of all kinds that I've encountered. And I have tried to study and research quite a lot of that. So um, that's part of what kept me going. And then about 2010, I encountered Wangari Maathai, who initiated the Green Belt Movement in Africa and got the Nobel Prize for it. 
And she tells a story that to this day, and I must have told this story hundreds of times, it gives me a tremor to tell the story. She said, and some of you may know the story, there was a big fire in the forest and all the big animals, the lions, the tigers, the elephants were running from the fire. And one tiny little hummingbird was flying towards the fire with one drop of water in her beak. And all the big animals laughed at her and they said, what do you think you're going to accomplish with one drop of water? And she said, that's all I can do. So does that answer your question? You're muted. I said thank you. I was also uh, curious about your your background. Um, um, are you an artist, a scientist? Or how do you, you know, see yourself? But also, you know, what what is your like, formal upbringing and education? I'm just curious. I am formally referred to as an echo artist, which is a transdisciplinary practice, which means that I operate simultaneously in the sciences and the arts without making a distinction, even though I also collaborate with many scientists, such as Jim and Jean. Um, my background is extremely multidisciplinary my uh, masters, my BFA and my masters were both in crossover disciplines of multimedia and electronic music. Um, but I'm also very uh, trained in painting and basic fine arts. Um, I got my PhD under a um, predator prey biologist. Angelica Hilbeck. My second was um, Jill, oh, now I'm forgetting her name. Uh, she's an Australian multimedia artist. And then my third was uh, Jean Turner, who's a wetlands biologist who was in charge of the BP spill monitoring. So it's fairly eclectic. Um, I don't consider myself a scientist, even though I did study physics and environmental science as part of my dissertation work. Um, I, uh, I've been studying law quite a bit recently for my recent work on ecocide, which will become an opera. And um, I guess I'm open to learning whatever I can, even if I do a miserable job of it, I'm still going to try and learn from it. Very impressive. Thank you so much for sharing. Very inspiring. Thank you so much for your interest. Are there any other questions? I think I'm kind of in awe of all the things that you do. So I'm just kind of good. I think I'm just kind of in awe of all the things that you've done. And I'm just kind of processing that. <laughs> oh, Melissa just unmuted. Well, did you say you did a project at the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art? And if so, yeah. is that still on display? No, no, no. It was back in 2007. It was called The Weather Report. It was curated by Lucy Lepard. And uh, maybe, were you there? Do you remember the show? I don't think I saw it, no. Yeah, well, I'm sure you could look it up. Uh, she. Well, this was organized partly by Marta Kern from Boulder, and they paired a number of us artists with a number of scientists. So I that's how I got paired with Jim initially. And then there was a full page write up in the New York Times Sunday Leisure section about us and our collaboration. And one of the things that they quoted in the article was that when we were first getting to know each other, I said something like, we're raping the environment. And Jim said, yeah, we are. And that's when we knew we would work well together.
Um, Gina, in response to your um, comment about doing a lot of different things, I think it actually takes a lot more energy to maintain an approach to research that is siloed. I think actually when we separate um, animal behavior from sociology, from soils analysis, from dance, from music, we do ourselves a tremendous disservice because what we end up doing is essentially reproducing the same research in different languages. And it's stupid. It's really stupid. Um, and that's particularly true of the boundary between uh, especially the hard sciences and art because we're really all working from the same kinds of systems analysis. The details are what's different. And uh, the, the devil is in the details and the details are incredibly important, but they're not the main event. The main event I think we're all confronting is the desperate need to change the systems that we take for granted that are familiar to us. And living in those systems is what's sapping our energy, not learning new systems. Yeah, I never thought about that, before. thought about it like that before. Um, it kind of reminds me of a, um, a theme in this community. I feel like we always keep coming up against is we don't, environmental issues and the climate crisis are, um, so dire that we all need to be um, working in our own specialties and um, not um, duplicating efforts. That's something that we say all the time is how do we not duplicate efforts? Um, how can we be strategic so that we're not all, you know, working, you know, like we're not all doing the same thing, but we're using our skills to kind of disperse and work at different points. Um, and that just what you said makes me think of that, that we're kind of, if, uh, you know, we're duplicating efforts by not um, recognizing that people are doing research and coming to conclusions about the same things in different ways. So um, it's a really, it's a really interesting point to think about. I'd like to add something to that. Uh, from my point of view, we are and have been in an escalating environmental war. And one of the most basic military premises is you divide and conquer. If you have all of us in our individual little silos crossing our T's and dotting our mm -hmm. I's, we're completely ineffectual, mm -hmm. completely. Yeah. And I have to say that my biggest obstacle in collaborating with people is confirmation bias. And honestly, the harder you go into the sciences, the more entrenched that is. People have the idea that art illustrates science, and that's the end of it. And that's just not true. Not for the best art, I don't think. And it's certainly not true for anybody working in the field of echo art. Since I made comments about patriarchies, I would love to hear from any of the men, if you dare. Well, I remember you saying too, you kind of, you kind of um, put the caveat, but I'm not necessarily talking about gender, I'm talking about a system. So maybe yeah. you could elaborate on that um, a, a little bit um, in terms of, um, yeah, how, how you, yeah, it's your definition would be great to hear more. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a really, really important point, and it's not an easy one to answer. Um, but let's take a very simplistic analysis, and I'll try to avoid anything political because I know what your caveats are about that. Uh, if you presume that a lot of the world is heading towards 
fascistic systems. We know that the heads of fascistic systems are very rarely, although apparently increasingly so, women. They're more often men. This does not mean that women don't have power. And unfortunately, a lot of those women are people who identify with male power. And they um, imitate male tropes in many ways. One of the simplest is that many women who are part of political systems, for example, adopt a lower register of the voice. So they will literally sound like a man. Or uh, this was more true in the past, women will dress and cut their hair in ways that look more like their male colleagues. Um, I will not name the name of the in particular very impressive educational institution, but the first time I visited it, what I noted was how desexualized all the women were in their presentations of themselves, in their clothing, in their non-makeup, and so on and so forth. Those are details. The point is that um, values that are cherished in women, such as being emotional, such as being sens sensual, such as being caring, such as being soft, which are incidentally characteristics often ascribed to indigenous peoples, are extremely unacceptable as a power mode. The power modes, and unfortunately this is particularly true in the sciences, are completely divested of any subjective emotion whatsoever. You take out any adjectives that might represent anything emotional or personal. And so the result is that we have a system on many levels in this culture that has no emotion, has increasingly little caring, and certainly does not value the sensual or the so soft parts of being a human being in this environment. And I will add that I know just as many men who are concerned with this and anxious to change those systems as I know women. That's why I say it's not gender related. But it's also true that at the top of the pyramid, you'll usually find a white male. Yeah, maybe. I, so thank you for that. And I think, you know, for me as a just just thinking about how I grew up, it was my mother that was influential in making me an emotional, strong communicator. I mean, she gave me I'm an only child, right? And I and she poured everything of herself into me in this regard. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm also now in the demographic of an older white male, um, but I consider myself a champion of diversity throughout my entire life. And I think for me, the, the, the pinnacle place to get to, and I'm sitting around my, a round table with my colleagues here today, so it's very, very symbolic, is that we're literally all at the same table in the same place together solving this paramount, this huge problem that we have as a global society. So that's the visual that I have in my head that where I would like to get, where I'm, I'm not over, I'm not under, I am truly at the table together trying to solve this problem. And that, so sometimes it's hard because you have to step back as a white male and go, yes, I've had privilege, I've had opportunities, I've had things that others haven't, and I need to make space for the others. But I, that doesn't mean that I am end up under the table. It ends up that it, it makes me feel like I just want to be at the table present and feel powerful. I want to feel my own power as a white male too, but in a good way, in a holistic way that's that's inclusive of everyone around me. So so that's I think we all we all have our struggles, right? We all come from a place and we have to recognize where we do have power and where we need to step back. But if that vision of us all being at the table together to solve something can be realized, that that's where I'd like to see us be, you know, um, and and quickly, <laughs> because as, as Gina said, the, the, t the time is now and, and the problem is huge. Um, Rick, I know you've had your hand raised. Yeah, I just thank you, I just, for that response. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you, Eric. Thanks, and I, I just wanted to support the uh, the end to patriarchy idea as well. Uh, 
you know, as a as a man, uh, I also grew up with a, a patriarchal father who was a former drill sergeant and kind of had that to toxic masculinity side. And I I saw all of it and and was irritated by it often. He was also a great guy, and so we we all tolerated it. Um, but I think you know the time for tolerating toxic masculinity is has passed, and we need to figure out how to. Uh, um, teach everybody that um, we're, we're one with the earth the concept too, that that's uh, part of this. Uh, um, I've had great uh, uh, female mentors, family members and, and educators and principals and and uh, been fortunate that way, uh, but also nature as a, as a teacher. And that's one reason why I focus on uh, getting kids connected with nature, uh, getting them out um, out in nature. The, the new video game I'm, I'm working on uh, tries to immerse kids in, in nature so they develop some appreciation that way as well. And I think we just need to be looking at um, every opportunity we can to um, kind of teach that humility, not, both in terms of male, female dynamics, but also just in terms of like human and the rest of the natural world dynamics, because uh, we've gotten ourselves in really serious problems now, thinking that we were kind of exceptional and we could do whatever we wanted to to the earth, and uh, it's it's really biting us <laughs> back now. Uh, and you know, daily reminders. It's pretty hard to watch the news these days if you're a caring person because of what's what's happening. And so I think. Uh, um, you know, we, we need to do everything from from getting kids to nature to, to doing these cool art projects, uh, installations, more than just projects, just kind of immersive things uh, to, to really help people understand that um, we, we need to be humble and we need to be one with, with the earth and listening to indigenous voices and, and folks that have figured out better ways to, to live with the earth, uh, uh, for example. Um, I'll pass it off to someone else. Thank you. And I think uh, implicit in what you just said, Rick, is there have to be ways to invite people like myself, echo artists, into the system to pay us respectfully and allow us to work with you to solve these problems. I encourage you to consider buying both books. Uh, the Echo Art in Action will give you a lot of ideas for STEAM education. And I think my book might help you gain some more insight into how to change systems. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Another great book is Braiding Sweetgrass. Anybody yes, who hasn't read it by Robin Wall Kimmerer, a very powerful book. It is. It is. Um, and these are parallel concerns. How do you invite not, uh, not just echo artists or women into the conversation, but how do you invite indigenous peoples into the conversations. Um, I see that Melissa put a link to um, Thank you, Melissa. The project in the chat. Um, and I know that some of us have to hop off for other calls as well. I want to talk the hour. Um, but I just want to say thanks for this really um, interesting discussion. And Aviva, thanks for um, sharing everything uh, other folks don't know, the context of <laughs> this, you know, did this presentation pretty pretty last minute. So I appreciate Aviva and me, um, jumping in and um, still having a really, really thoughtful presentation despite that. Um, so- Thank you again for inviting me. It was an honor yeah. and a pleasure. Yeah, and um, again, her email and, and website, I believe uh, were in the chat earlier, so check that out and uh thanks everyone see y'all see you on thursday see you on thursday <laughs> bye. bye thanks again bye. pleasure meeting you bye. all nice meeting you bye bye bye